Why can't we convince more historians of Jesus on that? Great question. Can a historian say Jesus rose from the dead? As an historian, I can't say whether Jesus rose from the dead. Once again? Historians acting as historians don't have the tools to prove that God raised Jesus. One more time. Without that idea that God does exist and could intervene, it might be more rational to say there's some other explanation. Yeah, yeah, no, I agree with you. Mm -hmm. I think we're finally getting somewhere. Welcome to Apologia, a YouTube show, YouTube channel show, where a former Christian takes a look at the claims of Christians. In our last apologetics episode, Dr. Dale Allison was here to respond to a recent critique of his work by pop apologist Frank Turek and New Testament scholar Mike Lacona. Dr. Allison was kind enough to take time to respond to the more personal charges leveled, but today I wanted to cycle back and address some of Frank's more general remarks in the same broadcast, some of which betray that Frank Turek may be secretly aware of the objections to his claims, despite consistently misrepresenting them. Here we go. And we have the great Dr. Michael Kona with us. We're going to talk about the resurrection. Frank asked Mike an excellent question. And what could that evidence possibly be that would come out that would cause us to say, I don't think Jesus rose from the dead, other than finding his body, right? If yeah. we could find it and identify it, that would be another problem. How would you know it was his? But how... I mean, what kind of evidence would we get? Could we get that would say, I don't think he rose from the dead? And Mike gave a long hypothetical about finding an ossuary bone box with an authenticated first century note about fooling everyone and DNA that matches the Shroud of Turin. Well, something like that, I, I wouldn't hold my breath waiting for something no. like that to happen. Um, but that would just confirm the resurrection. I sure, think. but then we'd have to try and explain why many of these people gave up their ancient Jewish religion for a lie that got them persecuted tortured and some of them killed how would we explain that that they maybe they thought it was true and went to their deaths anyway and only a small group of them had actually foisted this hoax on them and this small group knew it was a lie frank accidentally stumbles onto a very plausible answer a small number could very plausibly have convinced a larger number to go along with it and if this small number felt strongly enough about the cause of their interpretation of Jesus's messianic fulfillment, we've got a complete answer. But what if that small group was actually sincerely mistaken rather than actively lying? One or two sincerely mistaken people could start it all, and it would equally explain all the evidence without straining for anything unlikely or improbable. And the people that wrote down the New Testament maybe didn't think it was a lie. I mean, how would you... I think it's likely that the authors of the New Testament believed it to be true. Even at the most generous conservative dating, we're still talking about people writing decades after the actual events in an entirely different language, likely from geographical distance, with obvious literary dependence and equally obvious adaptations to accommodate theological differences. They were not eyewitnesses but are writing down the stories that were formed in decades of verbal evangelism. How would you... That's yeah, problematic. Yeah. But we have those kinds of things in history. Right, yeah. Um, we have those kind of things in New Testament studies. Exactly. There is plenty of precedent. It's entirely mundane. And the, the cumulative evidence for Mark and Priority is better, but there's still what are called the minor agreements of Matthew and Luke against Mark. It, I mean, I can explain it, but I, I don't want to get too far off mm -hmm. track here. Yeah that there were sources, either written or oral, that Matthew and Luke utilized in addition to copying Mark. Seems particularly strange if you want to think that Matthew was an eyewitness writing his own memoirs. A lot of the early church fathers who said Matthew wrote Matthew said that Matthew wrote in Hebrew or probably meaning the Aramaic dialect. We have only one extent source for this, Papias. And it's not really Papias, it's Eusebius quoting Papias. But the Matthew that we have today... See, uh, is, it, it's apparent it wasn't originally written in Aramaic. The one we have is was written in Greek, and it's not translation Greek. Even evangelical specialists in the Greek uh, language will say it's not translation Greek, meaning it was originally written in Greek. It was not okay. translated from another language. Right. So that would seem to suggest that the Hebrew Matthew, we don't have it. Hmm. The Matthew that we have is a different gospel of Matthew. And how do you explain these things? Exactly. And the easiest explanation is that whatever Papias was referring to is a book we don't have anymore. Other than stubborn Christian tradition, there's no reason at all to think that our Matthew and Papias's Matthew 
are the same document, and every indication that it's not. You got Papias in the beginning of the second century, uh -huh. and he talks about how Matthew wrote in the Hebrew dialect, again, mm -hmm. probably referring to Aramaic. And he's our earliest source and probably our best source about the authorship of Matthew and Mark. Exactly. He's our earliest and best, and it's terrible. Without the baggage of church tradition, no one would ever hear Papias' descriptions and then pick out our first and second gospels as a match. It'd be like asking someone to pick up ice cream. And they come home with a loaf of bread. And everyone just pretends for 2,000 years that the bread is actually ice cream. So there are pros and cons of the different arguments. Mm -hmm. And you got these tensions. And sometimes, you know, you just got to look at, well, who explains the tensions better? Mm -hmm. And which one seems like the most plausible explanation? Again, they do this in science as mm -hmm. well, as mm -hmm. you know. Uh, wave or particle. But there's <laughs> some things that seem to be both. And how right. do you explain that? Good grief. We don't need to invoke the mysteries of waves and particles. Just admit that Papias wasn't referring to the same documents that you're referring to. That completely explains the tensions. And it was me and you and Alex McFarland was the president of the seminary at the time, and Tom Howe and Richard Howe and Bart Ehrman. Yeah. We all went to dinner at Macaroni Grill there. I think I was at the Macaroni Grill. Mm, macaroni. Macaroni ready! We got talking to Bart and Bart said, well, who isn't a postmodernist? And everybody at the table except him raised their hand. We go, well, we're not postmodernists. And I said to him, Bart, it's, you know, postmodernism is self-defeating to say there's no truth is a truth claim. He said it's not that simple. It's not that simple because you were talking about history. And to try and, and I know there are probably varieties of this when you're looking at history. You know, how, how well can you know history? I get that. Okay. So if you know this, why are you still trotting out your silly self-defeating line? And giggling like you've won something. Yeah, but, there still is a truth. Yeah. We may not know it. Right, yeah. But there is uh, the correspondence yeah. of theory of truth. Correspondence theory of truth is true. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> That's right. I, I embrace correspondence theory of truth. Uh -huh. It's just that a lot of times in history, we can't know right. the truth. Right, right, right. You're saying right, right, Frank. But I'm not convinced you'll acknowledge this nuance in the future. Here's hoping you do. Dale was bringing up, as an historian, I can't say whether Jesus rose from the dead. And Bart Ehrman will say the same yeah. thing, that you can't say that Jesus rose from the dead because somehow suggesting a supernatural event took place is outside of the realm of history. Well, that's a philosophical presupposition. Why is it outside of the realm of history? You're not representing it correctly, Frank. From the IEP, accordingly, Hume says that no testimony is sufficient to establish a miracle unless the testimony be of such kind that its falsehood would be more miraculous than the fact which it endeavors to establish. We must always decide in favor of the lesser miracle. We must ask ourselves, which would be more of a miracle? That Jesus walked on water? Or that these scriptural reports of this event are false? While we may occasionally encounter testimony that is so strong that its falsehood would be very surprising indeed, we never come across any report the falsehood of which would be downright miraculous. Accordingly, the reasonable conclusion will always be that the testimony is false. The illustration I gave in my seven-hour debate earlier this year with, with Bart uh, Ehrman. With yeah. Bart. A debate you can still get at tinyurl.com slash Bart debate. At the appointed time, the comet slams into the moon. And as the lunar dust settles, there's a message written on the moon's surface in Hebrew and in Greek that says Jesus is Lord. <laughs> now, what a scientist, an astronomer, would say is this. Wow, that's quite remarkable. This example is entirely disanalogous, because we're talking about whether testimony alone could ever be sufficient to establish a miracle. Mike is conjuring up a scenario in modern times where there would be video footage, millions of photographs, and people can just look into the sky to affirm it. We could send astronauts up to study it firsthand. That's not testimonial evidence. For it to be an appropriate analogy, Mike would have to propose that a thousand years ago, someone claimed that the message Jesus is Lord appeared on the moon, even though the message is gone now. Would Mike believe such testimony? I suspect not. Now here's what the scientist would not say. Wow, that's an extraordinary event. And I don't have any natural explanations for this. Um, it would seem to require an intelligent cause behind it. But I don't have the tools to be able to determine anything about that cause. And so it, it would seem to require a miracle, but I don't have the tools to do it. And so I, um, I can't say, I can't affirm that the event itself occurred. Mm -hmm. I can't even say that the comet slammed on the moon's surface. Yes, because scientists wouldn't be relying on testimony. Scientists would be making direct observations. Yeah. But that's exactly what Ehrman is suggesting. Mm. He's saying, look, 
we could have all this evidence for the resurrection of Jesus. It could be the very best hypothesis to explain the evidence. But as a historian, I don't have the tools to be able to, de to determine it was God because it would require a miracle to, for Jesus to rise from the dead. And so therefore, I can't affirm the event itself. We're not rejecting the miracle claim because we can't explain it. We're rejecting the miracle claim because it's more likely that the testimony is incorrect or mistaken. Testimony is the problem, not the supernatural. The harsh reality is that even if a miracle happened, testimony can't prove it. We're still saying as historians, we can't ever say that the cause of a particular event was God. That's, that's a rule that we put on the study of history, apparently. My question is why? How can anyone say that the cause of any event was God? If a hungry person finds $20 on the sidewalk, did God cause that event? Maybe, maybe not. Did God cause the initial expansion of our universe? Maybe, maybe not. No one has proposed a mechanism to measure the influence of the supernatural on the natural. Historians aren't just being stubborn here. Mike gets it. Frank doesn't. Take the statement, Jesus' death atones for sin. Mm -hmm. All right. The historian can certainly look at the historical element of that statement. Jesus died and say, okay, but I can't, as a historian, uh, corroborate that his death indeed atones for sin. Unless you're also a theologian. Yeah, well, <laughs> what, what tools would even a theologian right. have to be able to corroborate that? If we have good historical evidence, he said these things, and we have good reason to believe he was God because of his resurrection, then we could and say... we'd have to have a good reason to say that everything he teaches is true. If he's God, we, we would say that by definition, God is infallible and only teaches the truth. Okay, so that yeah. would have to be argued. Right. I mean, I believe that, yeah, of yeah, course, yeah. but that would have to be argued. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, if we have a, a like, level... For example, the Muslims believe that God is a deceiver, mm -hmm. that sometimes he actually intentionally mm -hmm. deceives people. So let's take then, uh, from what you're saying, and say you got a historian, you got a natural theologian, mm -hmm. philosophy, and so forth, you put it all together, and you can make a cumulative case to say that Jesus' death atones for mm -hmm. sin, okay? So you could do the same thing with resurrection, mm -hmm. but... I guess my contention here is, back to the original question you had, why would Ehrman and, and Dale say mm. that historians can't? Right. And I'd say because historians, acting as historians, don't have the tools to prove that God raised Jesus. Yeah, because it struck me in your conversation with Dale that he kept saying, as an historian, I can't say, I can't say. And I was thinking to myself, how about as a human being, <laughs> can you say, right? Because yeah. uh, he seems to have walled off knowledge from just this historical question, did Jesus rise from the dead? See? So, you have accepted the truth. It's okay, Frank. You can use other reasons to hold to Christianity, but history isn't one of them. It seems you recognize this now, so just stop saying that you can affirm Jesus' resurrection historically. So if we're trying to go to the second of those questions, did Jesus rise from the dead, but we haven't established that this is a theistic world where God could intervene if he wanted to, then you might be a little bit more hesitant to say, well, Jesus rose from the dead, because without that idea that God does exist and could intervene, why would you then say he did intervene? It might be more rational to say there's some other explanation. Yeah, yeah no, I agree with you. That's exactly correct. Without first granting a God, it's more rational to say that there's some non-God explanation. Therefore, the resurrection evidence on its own is always going to be insufficient to prove God. But as a human being, you're supposed to have a broader view than that. And, and draw some conclusions, it seems. It seems that's what God wants us to do, right? Yeah. To, to, to not just say, well, I don't know. Or... This is Frank's philosophy. His God calls him to have certainty about everything, whether that certainty is warranted or not. Pick a side, insists Frank's God. After I left Christianity, one of the hardest things to get used to was being okay with saying, I don't know, when I don't know. You know, I, in, in some cases, I mean, I think it's fine to say, I don't know when we really mm -hmm. don't know. There are certain things that I would say when it comes to the New Testament, I just say, well, I, mm -hmm. I, I don't know. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know what to do mm -hmm. with that. And, and it's, it's fine with that. Admissions like that are why some Christians don't like fellow Christian Mike Lacona. Well, why, why, can't we, why can't we convince more historians of Jesus on that? Well, because worldview is involved mm -hmm. in, in that. So I don't think that we can expect that we're ever going to find a, a big consensus, a, a robust consensus, heterogeneous consensus on whether Jesus rose from the dead. Well, there's too many life implications for mm -hmm. that, right? 
Uh, we do find consensus that Alexander the Great did what he did, despite the fact that our earliest history of him is 400 years after he actually walked the earth. Or best history, yeah. Yeah, best history. He's Alexander the Great. Aha! Caught you, Mr. You made one fatal mistake. You see, this wasn't a Hanalizer. It was an Alexander the Great Eliza. Take him away, Beryl! No one questions that Alexander the Great conquered because the evidence is sufficient for what is ultimately an incredibly mundane claim. Tribes conquered other tribes throughout history. Nothing surprising. And as Mike said earlier, all history is held with an open hand. So when pressed, ancient historical facts are only tentative likelihoods. More importantly, most people don't question it because it has no impact on their lives. If tomorrow we found conclusive evidence that Alexander the Great never won a single battle, my life would change not one little bit. But if you're going to say Jesus rose from the dead, that has implications on how we live and where we might be going in eternity. So that's a much higher bar for people. That's correct and appropriate and was at the heart of the William Lane Craig kerfuffle last year. Epistemic justification focuses on providing truth-directed reasons in support of your belief. That is to say, it tries to marshal reasons to show that the belief is true. By contrast, pragmatic justification um, focuses on non-truth-directed reasons. Typically, pragmatic justification will be a kind of cost-benefit analysis of believing and will play off the costs and benefits to determine whether a person should uh, hold that belief. And why he has been dubbed Low Bar Bill. If there is just one chance in a million that this is true, it's worth believing. They, they don't even want to try and jump it. Yeah, that's right? true. Not true at all. Many people, myself included, try desperately to clear even the low bar and simply couldn't. You know, a few years ago, uh, I heard someone say that the evidence we have for Jesus' resurrection <laughs> is as good, if not better, than what we have for Caesar's cross in the Rubicon. Mm -hmm. And I thought, no, that's really pushing it. And so I looked into it myself and I looked, okay, within a relatively recent period of time, what, what's the evidence we have for Caesar's cross in the Rubicon? And we've got nine sources written within, if I remember right, within 200 years okay. of the Rubicon crossing. And of those, I think there are only four that were eyewitnesses. So four eyewitness reports of the Rubicon crossing? In a best case scenario, only two of the gospels are eyewitness accounts. So far, Caesar is winning. Even Caesar himself doesn't mention the, his crossing the Rubicon in his commentary on the Civil War. Um, what he does do indirectly is he speaks about being in um, Ariminum, and then he speaks about being in Ravenna. Well, you got to cross the Rubicon to get, to get there, there. Right. but he doesn't mention the Rubicon uh -huh. crossing. So you've got indirect references, mm -hmm. things like that. Pity we don't also have Jesus writing about himself. He wouldn't have to mention resurrection. He could just talk about his experiences before and after his death. To be clear, none of the Gospels narrates an actual resurrection. They report Jesus before death and Jesus after death. These are indirect in the same way the Rubicon crossing is indirect. So not a differentiation. But you don't have an eyewitness saying that, you know, Caesar himself isn't saying he, he was there. So you have like a couple of eyewitnesses. They didn't see him cross the Rubicon, but they say he crossed the Rubicon. That's confusing. How can you call them eyewitnesses if they didn't see anything? Is this the standard you use for gospel eyewitnesses as well? They were eyewitnesses of risen Jesus. They didn't see risen Jesus, but they say there was a risen Jesus. We have very different definition for eyewitnesses. Cicero wrote a letter that we have, and that was probably written within just a, a couple of weeks of Caesar's crossing the Rubicon. A couple of weeks? That seems a lot better than the decades for the Gospels. So you got this kind of stuff, and, and these authors are biased. Some of them have, all, they contradict one another mm -hmm. on certain things. They, they mention supernatural entities. Really? Like Lucan okay. and Plutarch, mm -hmm. you've got them doing that. So if, if you're going to mention miracles and things like that that discredit the Gospels, you're going to discredit a whole lot of these Greco-Roman and Jewish sources that mention things because they mention miracles mm -hmm. and portents and apparitions. And, and and I absolutely do discount sources that mention supernatural entities. What I don't do is decide that implausible claims must be true just because they're mixed in with some plausible ones. And my conclusion is that the quality of the sources we have for Jesus 
resurrection are every bit as good mm -hmm. as what we have for mm -hmm. Caesar's crossing the Rubicon. There are fewer sources for Jesus, fewer potential eyewitnesses, and they are later. By what math are they every bit as good? Um, in some sense, Caesar's crossing the Rubicon, uh, the evidence might be a little better than we have for the resurrection. Good save. But I'd say the documentary evidence of just taking that is better for the resurrection than we have Caesar's crossing the Rubicon. Everything Mike has described is documentary evidence. How does this descriptor suddenly elevate the Jesus stuff? A distinction without a difference. I remember Bart Ehrman saying this. Um, do you remember what George Bush said in the 2005 State of the Union address? And of course, all of us are going to go, well, of course not. Why would we? And he, he makes that like it's a parallel to uh, the disciples remembering what Jesus said when he was on the earth. How could they write it down? Yeah, well, that's a, it's a bad parallel. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's atrocious. Yeah. And I can remember a Bush state of the, it wasn't a state of the union, it was a Bush speech. I think it was nine days after 9-11 when he, he gave the address to Congress. You remember when he held up that badge? Okay. So invoking 9-11 is probably the worst thing Frank can do for his case here. People who are watching right now are old enough. Where were you when the second plane hit the tower? You remember something about that day. You might not remember what you had for breakfast this morning. But you'll remember an event. I'll bet they remember the weather. Oh, yeah. Oh, on 9-11? Mm -hmm. Crystal clear. Yep. Right now, it's like a little over 21 years ago. But if I would ask you where you were 21 days ago, you'd go, I don't know. Let me look at my iPhone, right? But there's no impact event 21 days ago. Impact event 21 years ago, everyone remembers. Mm -hmm. A team of researchers, including Dr. Elizabeth Phelps, have been involved in a long-term study involving people's memories about 9-11 as what they call a flashbulb event. Within a few days of the event, they started having subjects complete surveys about everything they remember, both about the attack itself and their personal circumstances on the day. They reissued the surveys after a year, three years, and 10 years after. Despite an average confidence score of 80%, subjects recall consistently was only 63% after the first year and 57% after three years. Describing the study, Phelps said, what we've known for a while is that emotion gives you stronger confidence in your memory than it does necessarily in the accuracy. The same pattern has been borne out in other flashbulb studies like memory distortions develop over time, recollections of the O.J. Simpson trial, and false recollections of hearing the news about Challenger, and the entire body of false memory work by Elizabeth Loftus. Wow. I mean, that was a period of unity. Mm -hmm. It was an impact event. If you saw that, you'll never forget that. And I think some of the things Jesus said were impact events. Certainly the resurrection was an impact event. I don't think they could have gotten that wrong. Data tells us otherwise. Though I should caveat that people do tend to get some broad strokes correct. Subjects are right that a terror attack occurred, but not about how many planes were involved. But Frank and Mike don't want to concede that the gospel writers could have been wrong on any detail. Right? Yeah. If they had seen him physically risen from the dead and had touched him and ate with him... They wouldn't have forgotten that. You fully shifted the goalpost now from could a disciple recall lectures of Jesus word for word to could a disciple recall touching a formerly dead person. In your words, a terrible analogy. It's a terrible analogy. It is. But of course, I don't see any reason to think that the gospel writers were eyewitnesses. So this is all just hand-wringing. Now, if you want to add a theological aspect to us, then we could bring in the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Yeah, I think Christians should just stick to supernatural explanations of divine inspiration. These natural ones don't work out. In talking to our mutual friend Gary Habermas, I said, Gary, how many of the scholars that you're, you're investigating in your magnum opus, which is now nearly 5,500 5, pages, suggest that the New Testament writers invented the resurrection? And he basically says... No, I don't think very many of them say they invented it. What they might say is maybe they were mistaken. Hey, that's what I said earlier. Frank does know this. Is it possible that they were mistaken? Is it possible that these stories were embellished over many years and what they considered at one point maybe was a spiritual resurrection somehow later became a physical resurrection? I mean, I mean, the mistake could have been a physical resurrection the whole time, but both scenarios are evidentiarily indistinguishable from each other. So either is in play here. And I think Dale and Bart would even, look, Bart has himself written and said publicly, Paul believed in the bodily resurrection of Jesus. Okay. Mike, don't make me bring Bart in here, because I will. But for today, we can just do a quick search in his blog. 
Here's one of many times he's answered this. Paul stresses that Jesus rose from the dead in a spiritual body. Both terms are important for understanding Paul's view of the resurrection of Jesus. Jesus was raised in the body, but it was a body that was spiritual. The disciples believed in the bodily, physical resurrection of Jesus. It wasn't a spiritual, immaterial resurrection. It was a physical, bodily resurrection of Jesus. We have absolutely no way to know what any of the 12 disciples believed on this very subtle nuance, because not a single one of them wrote down what they thought about this. My indignation here is built on my rejection of traditional authorship of the Gospels and non-Pauline epistles. But even granting it, the Gospel of John is ambiguous. Thomas putting fingers in Jesus' side, but in the same chapter, Jesus leaves a locked room without using the door. 1st and 2nd John affirm Jesus was flesh before he died, but 1st John 3, 2 suggests returning Jesus was spiritual. 1 Peter 1 seems to indicate a non-human body of some kind for Jesus, and chapter 3 is even more clear, saying Jesus was put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. Traditional authorship or not, Mike's confidence on the disciples' view on bodily resurrection versus spiritual resurrection versus maybe they didn't even think in those terms is unwarranted by the evidence. Now, that's what they believed. So, Herman would say, hallucinations. Still? Yeah. Yes, still. But keep in mind, hallucination is but one of countless ways people can be sincerely mistaken. Um, and what, what's what's the what's the foil to that? I mean, he, other than that the empty tomb would be one, I guess, right? Dr. Ehrman rejects the proposal that Jesus was ever put into a tomb, at least of the kind described in the Gospels. That when you understand hallucinations and all the research that's been done by, mm-hmm. by experts in the mental health profession over the years, only approximately 7% of the group most likely to experience a hallucination, meaning people grieving the loss of a loved mm-hmm. one, only 7% of them on average experience a visual hallucination. I have several videos on this in detail that you can go check out. But Mike here is making the huge blunder of thinking that visual hallucination is a historical fact that needs to be explained. Mike's so-called minimal fact is that the disciples had experiences that led them to believe that Jesus rose from the dead. You'll notice no reference that those experiences were visual confirmation. All the reports are that he appeared Mm. to them. That's visual. Well, not the first report. The one in 1 Corinthians upon which you rest your case. Sure the one from decades later, but those aren't historian accepted. And it's not just 7%. I mean, 7% of, let's say, uh, 12. And of course, you don't have Judas, but you had Matthias, and you had Mm -hmm. others that became part of the 12. Mm -hmm. So um, 7% of 12 would be one. Mm -hmm. Maybe you're getting toward two. Hey, that's exactly what my no resurrection required hypothesis puts forth. One disciple, maybe two, had a hallucination. Thank you for the affirmation. But... All the reports are all of the disciples experienced an appearance of the risen Jesus. So, number one, it's not 7%, it's 100%. Number two, you've got group appearances. Mm-hmm. Now, Ehrman contends that you can have group appearances, but the examples he gives are really poor, like the Marian apparitions. Mm-hmm. Those are very, very different than mm-hmm. what we have of the appearances of the risen Jesus. Once again, let's look at what Dr. Ehrman recently wrote on this. As odd as it may seem, group hallucinations are a well-documented phenomenon. Or at least they are explicitly affirmed precisely by the apologists who complain that I can't explain the appearances of Jesus to groups because groups cannot have hallucinations. That is to say, even though these apologists say it's not possible when it comes to Jesus, they think that it does happen in other instances. More specifically, in the instance of Jesus' mother. These apologists, the ones I'm talking about, are Protestants. They don't believe Mary appears to anyone, let alone groups. How then do they explain that groups claim that they have seen her? Well, apart from saying they don't really see her, even though they claim they do, they don't have anything to say. Why is it different with Jesus? Mike and his apologist friends want to point to nuances in gospel stories to find differences to make the scenario seem disanalogous. But clearly he can't deny that there are groups of people who claim to see things that a video camera wouldn't record. Personally. I suspect that some level of social contagion was at play here, causing people to genuinely affirm experiences they did not have. But I leave that for homework for the viewer. Meanwhile, again, let me beat the drum that group experiences aren't a historical fact that needs explaining. They are a disputed claim, not a broadly accepted one. As far as I can tell, the group appearances are clearly in the category of later legend. And then you got Paul. 
Paul isn't grieving the... Uh, the, the no, uh, he's trying to kill Christians. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. So Jesus is the last person in the universe uh, that Paul would have wanted to see or expect to see. There's nothing about hallucinations that require them to be welcome. Hallucination hypothesis just does not work. It mm. is a really poor hypothesis. Not if hallucination merely started a spark of stories that became embellished over the years. But is Ehrman trying to say that so many of these stories were embellished over the years? See? Sometimes Frank gets it. The form in which we have them, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Yeah, he would say they're embellished. Okay, so Mike gets it too, and just chose to waste our time on non sequiturs that didn't hit the heart of the objection. Because it doesn't change the essential fact. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Jesus mm -hmm. died. He was the son of God who, who mm -hmm. died. Mm -hmm. And, and, then, and rose then rose. The, and then rose from the dead. And the objections to it seem uh, not to be at least persuasive in my view. And what is persuasive to Frank is entirely unpersuasive to me. The question is, have you seriously considered all sides of an issue, removing as much bias as possible? Frank is employed by an organization that requires him to sign a statement saying that he'll keep being a Christian. I was a Christian who desperately wanted it to be true but learned too much to keep believing. And to this day, I'm hoping to find a reason to return to the faith. I bet my YouTube channel would do even better if I reconverted. I could be in the Lee Strobel, J. Warner Wallace Club. There's always a, another angle on a piece of evidence that is brought forth by a skeptic that I don't think they've considered. At this point, I think I've considered it. But I'm always open to new evidence, should you ever have any. I listen to your show every week, Frank. I'm ready. I don't know. It, it's, it, it seems to be a, a text that we can rely on that wasn't embellished over several decades. It's undeniable that the text was adapted as it passed through the hands of the authors of Mark, then Matthew and Luke, and finally John. But to be clear, the decades of embellishment that people should be concerned about are the decades before it was written down when it was most pliable. Thanks, Dr. Mike Lacona. Thank you for being here on the I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Ape. Easy for me to say. I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist bonus podcast. Maybe one day we'll need to talk about how the name of Frank's podcast uses the word faith in a way that he would insist atheists shouldn't use for Christians. In any case, for more cross-examination of Frank and Mike and apologists like them, tap on the video on screen now, and I'll see you over there. Until next time, later. Thank you.